Fundamentals course brought to you by Moz Academy. I'll be your instructor, Brian Childs, and you can see my Twitter handle here, at The Growth Pilot, if you'd like to follow me online. In this course, we're going to be speaking about some of the core concepts useful for any SEO implementation. The discussion will start with asking this question, where does SEO fit in your digital strategy? You may use paid ads, email, or social media, and we need to ask ourselves, where does SEO fit? How do we use it? And where is it relevant? We'll then dive into search engine result pages and search intent, asking what can we learn about what we see in search engine results? It's quite an interesting discussion, and hopefully you'll find that valuable. We then go a little bit more technical, talking about crawling and indexing, where we'll discuss how is it that things show up in the search results, and what can we do to diagnose if we're not showing up in search results. Some very fundamental concepts there. And then we'll round out with a discussion about algorithms. What are the main algorithms? What's the evolution been in algorithms? And where are we now that can help us understand some of the most current optimization efforts that are out there? Hope you find this valuable, and thanks for joining class. In this section, we'll discuss where does SEO fit in a digital strategy? There's really two lessons associated with this section. We're going to talk about the SEO methodology, so that'll be an overview of generally how search engine optimization projects are organized, and then we'll map search engine optimization to the sales funnel. So between these two, you'll have a decent understanding of kind of how to approach SEO and maybe uh, get a decent sense of maybe how it fits with other digital marketing aspects. So let's go ahead and jump into those. In this lesson, let's discuss the SEO methodology. That is a process that you can use when implementing SEO generically for any site. It really consists of these following steps. Usually you're going to begin with a research phase where if you're working with a client or internally, you're going to define goals. That is, what are we trying to accomplish? What pages do we want to see more traffic in? Uh, what kind of conversions do we want to have? You'll also uh, investigate different keywords based upon your personas or the different uh, portions of the sales funnel that you might target. Uh, there's often some competitive analysis that takes place here. And then because SEO, like most digital marketing activities, is a iterative process, you'll define some of the tests you want to run. So for example, let's see if we uh, change something on our site, does it improve against the goal that we've defined, right? So you want to define those goals and then define the tests that are going to help uh, prove out those goals. Um, the next phase, once you have that, is to do a very comprehensive site audit. So in this case, you would be looking at inhibitions to whether or not you're indexed, or is your site accessible, what is your content like, and do some analysis of the authoritativeness of your links and your link building process. So research first, and then do a site audit. Oftentimes, these two steps could be conflated in done at the same time. But nonetheless, there's a first step and a second step. Later, once you have done your keyword research and you've audited your site for the different types of issues it may have, then you want to move into your optimization. Now, oftentimes with people doing search engine optimization, they will start at step three. They'll say, let's start changing page titles. Let's start changing meta descriptions. Let's get more links. And they haven't done the necessary research and audit steps to really make the most of these optimization phases. So this includes things like, is our content optimized? Can we do any technical optimizations? All different variety of things in there. And again, those relate to some of the tests that you want to run. Once you've done and optimized some of your pages, then you can move into the amplification phase. That is, let's get links to these pages that we've, uh, we've optimized. So doing backlink analysis, identifying different sources for links, things like that, using social media to get the word out about different pages that you want to see if you can improve the conversions or traffic to. And then 
you want to very importantly use this fifth step, which is measure what you've done against the test that you define and report on it. Say, hey, how have we done? Are the things that we're doing measurable? Have they had the desired impact? If it looks like it hasn't had the desired impact, that's fine sometimes. Learning means that you sometimes are successful, sometimes you're unsuccessful, but you want to make sure that you establish good goals and define those tests in the beginning so you can measure and report against them. Another way to look at this methodology is to say, in step one, we're really defining the competitive landscape, right? We're talking to our internal stakeholders or our clients and defining the competitive landscape. Then we want to do a site audit and identify what are our strengths and weaknesses within that competitive landscape? Where are we strong? Where are we weak? What are things that we can change? And then there's a number of implementation phases. So again, oftentimes people will start search engine optimization activities at step three when they haven't done the appropriate research and audit phases. So just when you're doing SEO, realize that you're probably going to have to move things to the left a little bit and make sure you're defining goals and doing a lot of research prior to ever uh, changing things on the site. It's really helpful. Hope that helps. Let's look at the sales funnel and how it relates to search queries. This is very helpful for search engine optimization because you can learn something about where someone is in the sales funnel by the types of queries that they make. Let's begin, however, with a brief introduction to the sales funnel itself. The sales funnel often consists of three phases called top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel. The purchase uh, icon here on this graph shows what would be whatever goal you want the person to complete. If you're an e-commerce site or a brick and mortar business, then maybe purchase literally means buying something at your site or buying something at your store. <clears throat> However, uh, if you're a nonprofit, maybe purchase just simply means signing up for an event or volunteering. When we think of people in the top of the funnel, the top of the funnel relates to people defining their challenge. So they have a problem or they have some kind of intent and they're just looking to define it. So imagine that you are uh, going to a wedding and you're trying to figure out what kind of clothing to wear based upon the weather. You know, you're looking for ideas, you're doing question type uh, queries. Middle of the funnel, is where someone has transitioned into where they're comparing different options. So they've defined their problem, now they're looking at different options and refining those options based upon whatever criteria is relevant to them. It might be price, it might be proximity, uh, or availability of uh, different types of products. When people transition into the bottom of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel is where they're looking at different solutions specifically. So they've decided on what their decision criteria are, and now they're looking at maybe different brands or different options. Uh, do I build this myself or do I have someone come and build it for me? Do I try to fix my bathroom or do I hire someone to fix my bathroom? Those are very bottom of the funnel kinds of behaviors. So that is the sales funnel, top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. And we might ask ourselves, how is this relevant to search engine optimization? Why are we talking about the sales funnel? Well, the reason is because almost everyone begins their purchase process using search queries. That is, they are Googling or binging stuff and trying to learn about the different solution that they're seeking prior to ever making contact with a brand. So by the time that someone actually reaches out to a brand or has a brand experience, they've traveled down that sales funnel quite a ways. Um, and so we need to take that into account. So the interesting thing is that we can tell based upon search behaviors, kind of where people are within the sales funnel. So if we look at different queries, that is, we look at different search engine result pages, we can actually see uh, maybe where people are. So in the top of the funnel, people are often querying things that are either question formats, they tend to have very low technical language, they're not using the correct terms. So if you're in a highly technical field, uh, the kinds of queries that people are using as they're trying to learn about their problem are not going to use the correct technical language. Um, and there tends to be 
lower competition in the top of the funnel queries. You're not going to see a lot of ads because it's just harder to target those people because it's such broad types of queries. In the middle of the funnel, the types of queries that occur become more like comparisons. So uh, this option versus that option or compare these two options. That's very middle of the funnel types of queries. And if you search for something like that, you're going to see a middle of the funnel kind of result. You'll start noticing that ads begin showing up in the search engine result pages in middle of the funnel queries. Bottom of the funnel queries, search queries, are tend to be very branded. There tends to be a lot of ads showing up and much higher competition purely because it's so close to the purchase. So when things are close to the purchase, it tends to have more competition. More people are vying for those bottom of the funnel search queries. And we can illustrate this with an example. So here's a very kind of, uh, you know, maybe tail case example, but let's say that we are, uh, we have a house and we want to widen our driveway. And before we begin widening our driveway, we, we're not sure whether or not we need special permits for that. Okay, so just imagine this use case. Here I'm going down the sales funnel for this. I need to build a driveway. Okay, in the top of the funnel, the questions are very much like, I don't know what my problem is, right? What if, like, what if my driveway cro crosses someone else's land? Is that a problem? Do I need special permits for that? Like, how do I, what should I do about that? Um, in the middle of the funnel, we'd see things that I start using technical language. I start using the correct terminology where I say, oh, you know what, these are, I either need a right of way for my neighbor or maybe we need to talk about getting an easement. You're not going to see that kind of terminology often in the top of the funnel because it's considered more technical language, right? And then in the bottom of the funnel, that's where we're, you know, deciding whether or not we're going to build this driveway ourselves or if we're going to hire somebody else to build the driveway for us. In this case, you can see an example at the top there that says, you know, Sanderson's gravel and driveway contact, right? This is a query that I'm running to find a particular type of business by their name, and I'm looking to contact them, right? I'm very close to actually making that purchase and making a decision. So here again, we see these types of queries taking place. What is the top of the funnel query? It's a question. What is the middle of the funnel type of query? Very classic, is gonna be a comparison. And what's the bottom of the funnel type of query? We're gonna see branded search queries, a lot more competition for that business. When we think about where SEO works, what we're trying to do, right, is it plays a decent role in placing your brand higher up the funnel. So we could say, we are going to try to attract people to our website with these question base and comparison type queries, maybe give them a compelling offer, see if we can get their email address, and then move them or nurture them down to the bottom of the funnel. Now they have brand awareness. So SEO plays an important role in attracting and developing brand awareness higher up the funnel and then bringing them down to the bottom of the funnel where ads become more competitive. In this section, we're going to talk about SERPs and search intent. So here's the outline of this section of lessons. We're going to ask, what is a SERP? You're going to see this term used commonly in blogs and in discussions about SEO. Let's go ahead and define it and make sure you feel comfortable with it. What is a SERP? Then we're going to look at these SERPs and define amongst them the three types of search intent. Search intent is a really interesting way of assessing what we see within search engine result pages. And so we're going to go over the top three types. Then we'll discuss briefly branded search intent. It's not one of the typical three types that are mentioned often in SEO. However, we'll call out branded search intent specifically and talk about the implications there. Okay, in this lesson, okay, in this lesson, let's just talk about SERPs. So what is a SERP? And what does that word even mean? In SEO, we're going to see this term used quite a bit. And SERP just refers to search engine results page. So when I run a query in a search engine, 
the page that shows up, that is a SERP. So here's an example of a SERP for the word avocados. I have uh, queried the word avocados in Google, and it delivers me this page. Now, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in modern SERPs. So, for example, we see some organic links, right? So the organic links would be the top uh, result on the page, as well as that Wikipedia article. Uh, we see a people also ask box, okay, which has like, some little drop downs and some additional questions, some top stories from the news. Um, and then we see a knowledge panel on the, the right hand side of the screen. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on in modern SERPs. And we have to ask ourselves, is there anything we can learn just by looking at the page about what type of query this is? Okay. Let's alter our query just slightly and see what happens. So here I'm looking at avocados with an S, but what if I remove the S and just look at the word avocado? Hmm, well now that Wikipedia article moves to the top, the 12 proven health benefits article moves down from there. Okay, so basically we've had the second result become the first result and the first result become the second result. We see the people also ask, questions have changed the top stories and some of the images, and then over on the right-hand side, definitely some changes. So let me flip back and forth between these two. Look at those images on the right-hand side. Hmm, slight changes. Look at the top stories. Slight changes. So minor, minor changes in the search queries can have a not insignificant uh, change to the way the results are displayed. Let's do another change. So here I've looked at avocado calories. So I've added additional component to this query. And wow, that search engine result page or SERP has changed fairly dramatically. So here we see a little calculator by the looks of it that says it's from the USDA. Uh, we see the people also ask box has different queries in it. Um, the organic results are pushed down uh, to the bottom of the page over there. And then everything that shows up in the knowledge panel on the right hand side, uh, we're missing some images and a lot more nutrition facts. So very interesting. How about let's make another change. Avocado toast. Okay, so avocado toast. When I use the same word avocado, add the word toast to it. Now, the entire page changes. All we see are recipes. There's a lot of images that show up, some star ratings in the results there. Um, and then we see some images on the right hand side that are purely looking at avocado toast as well as a little excerpt from the Wikipedia article. So when we look at SERPs, search engine result pages, what we want to be paying attention to is what shows up what changes with minor changes in those different search queries. And if we can try to derive this, which is search intent. Search intent is the way or the intent that the person has when they're running the query. What is it that they want to learn or see or do by completing that query? And so we want to assess search intent. And you can see amongst all those different examples we use with minor variations, the search intent changed pretty considerably. Let's talk about the three types of search intent and how you can derive these by looking at a search engine result page or SERP. So there's really three flavors of uh, search intent, some three common flavors. Sometimes you'll read articles that break that out into five or six different types, but oftentimes there are three main search intent types considered in SEO. The first one and the most common one is called informational search intent. Let's look at a search engine result page that shows informational search intent. Okay, so here we've run a query for corgi breeds. This is a very excellent example of an informational search. So in an informational search intent query, what we see is just, just information about a particular topic. Here we've asked about corgi breeds. The search engine has returned results that talk about um, facts about corgis, um, information and pictures. We can see on the right hand side here that it has a Wikipedia article and a knowledge panel or information panel there. Um, so very informational heavy search queries. There is not 
uh, a link on here trying to get me to buy a Corgi. Uh, there is not a comparison necessarily. There's a little bit of this people also search for, but not really comparisons with um, informational search intent. It's just a bunch of information about the topic that we've queried. So when we cover up these things, what we call SERP features, so search engine result page features, we can see that the organic results are actually quite limited on this page. So in informational searches, uh, when we cover up SERP features, that's all the stuff that is not the organic results, you can see that it's actually uh, quite limited. There's a lot of SERP features that show up on these types of queries. And for reference, about 50 to 80% of all queries are informational type queries. Now, it's very interesting when you think about where informational search queries show up within the sales funnel. They are primarily associated with top of the funnel queries. So a lot of people are conducting informational type searches, and it's the most common type, and it tends to be related to the beginning of the journey that people make towards purchases. The next type of search intent, the second type of search intent, is called transactional search intent. Let's take a look at a transactional search intent result page. Here I have queried the word dishwasher. Okay, Not saying I want to buy a dishwasher, not saying what are the prices of dishwashers, just the word dishwasher, and we can say something about the results here. Compare this to the informational search. Here we see shopping results, which are sponsored along the right-hand side of the page. We see ads, very heavy ad placement at the top of the page. And again, if we cover up the SERP features, that is all the things that are not organic results, what do we get? We see again that very, very small amount of real estate on the search engine result page is to organic results. And in this case, we see very branded search results, right? So these are large brands that have a heavy presence within the organic results. So this is a transactional search uh, intent query, and it has a lot of ads associated with it because what we're saying here is we're saying, in essence, the search engine is interpreting this as saying, well, if you say the word dishwasher, then I'm assuming you want to buy a dishwasher. So I'm going to show you a bunch of things about how to buy and how to compare dishwashers. Okay. This is generally related to the middle and bottom of the funnel, right? So it's, I'm comparing dishwashers, I'm looking at two different types, or maybe I'm ready to make that purchase. So transactional search intent starts moving us down the sales funnel. The last most common search intent type is called a navigational search intent. So what is navigational search intent? Let's look at a search engine result page that displays this. Here is a navigational search intent query. It looks very different than the others. I say climbing gym. Now I am in Seattle when I ran this query. And so without putting any geo modification or using any sort of town or city name associated with it, all I say is climbing gym. And what does it display me? It displays me this local pack or a map result. Shows me a map, shows me three results associated with it. And if we cover up the non-organic results in here, Wow, look at that. The SERP feature, if we cover it up, takes up almost the entire above the fold real estate of this search engine result page. So when the search engine interprets your intent to be navigational in nature, that is, I want to go to a physical location, I want to visit a, uh, a particular business that has a physical location, um, it'll display these map results, and they don't generally display organic results above the fold. It takes up quite a bit of real estate. Now, because navigational search intent has such a high correlation with visiting a physical location after it's been completed, it is considered very bottom of the funnel. Okay? Uh, imagine that you are searching for a sandwich shop near you or looking for coffee. The likelihood is very much that the search engine is going to interpret that you want a sandwich or you want coffee right now. So that means it's very close to the purchase, and therefore it falls at the bottom of the funnel. So that's navigational search intent. Those are the three types of search intent, informational, transactional, and navigational.
When developing an SEO strategy, it's important to understand the concept of branded search intent. Branded search intent often comes into play when you see a business doing keyword research or analyzing their keyword rank positions. Because oftentimes businesses will be tracking keywords that have their name included in it. So if you're, say, Banana Republic, and you track the keyword, uh, you know, women's sundresses, Banana Republic, or men's dress shirts, Banana Republic, and those are the keywords you're tracking, it's important to make the distinction that those are branded search queries. And let's take a look at what a branded search query or a branded search intent looks like. Here we have an example of this. So... Here I've just run the query for climbing harnesses. So if you're a rock climber, you have a climbing harness, and here's just a query that shows that. We can tell by looking at the search result without knowing anything else that what we have here is we have a transactional search intent, right? So we see a lot of ads. We see some shopping results. This is obviously uh, the search engine interpreting that we want to purchase one of these. Um, we see a number of different uh, category pages. So REI uh, has a couple of different organic search results down at the bottom of the page, right? However, if we add in this branded term, so Petzl, Petzl is a manufacturer of climbing harnesses. If we add in the branded term to this query, look at what happens to those results. So we still have a transactional um, search intent taking place here, right? We still see a lot of ads, we see a lot of shopping results, but look at those organic results in particular in the bottom left corner of the screen here. I'll go back. Here's the original one, climbing harnesses, no brand. We have REI and REI are the two main results and the organic results. These are um, catalog type pages showing a number of different comparisons probably of results. And as soon as I add the branded result, what do we get? We get that brand showing up in the results page. So now the organic results below the ads are both Petzl. So when you include the name of the company in the search query, you're going to see oftentimes that business showing up in the top results. You're telling the search engine that you want to see results somewhat narrowed to that brand. Uh, if we cover up the uh, SERP features, that is, in this case, on a transactional search, the, um, the shopping results on the right and the ads at the top of the, uh, the organic results, um, we just can see or isolate those organic results down there at the bottom. <clears throat> you should expect that when you see a business using or tracking branded search queries, in their campaigns or projects, when you see that taking place, you should expect that they rank high for those results. So imagine if you're tracking search results over time, you're talking to a business owner, and that business owner says, we rank very high for XYZ uh, search queries. If you look in their account information or their tracking results, whatever they're using to monitor their keywords, you may see that they actually are ranking for those terms plus their name. That is a branded search intent. And when there's branded search intent, you're going to find they typically rank very high, which is different than if you remove the brand from the search query and see how they result for a non-branded term. Very important distinction. It's a very common mistake that most businesses make. A good, SEO. a good SEO is intellectually curious about what shows up in search engine result pages beyond just what the results are, but also what are the additional features and attributes that show up in a SERP. Let's take a look at an example and we'll walk through some of the common elements that we see in search engine result pages as well as what they mean. So here we have a search engine result page for a query that says how to remove a sticker from a car window. So let's go ahead and walk through the things that we see on this search engine result page. 
So first, at the top of every single result is a count of pages that meet the criteria that we've used. So here I asked this question, how to remove a sticker from a car window, and the search engine has looked in its database of pages, right? what we call that, its index, it looks into its index, and says there are 1,130,000-ish results that meet that criteria, that meet that expectation. So I'm going to display those, I'm going to rank them in some way. This number is very useful when you use search modifiers. So you can adjust the search query to say, only show me results on a particular site, and it'll show you roughly the count of pages that it has uh, within the site that you've designated. So there's different things you can do. Just keep in mind what it's doing is it's looking in its database, in its index, and delivering the number of pages that meet that criteria. Okay, let's go ahead and jump down to the next thing on the page. This is called a featured snippet. Now, featured snippets come in three different forms. This one is a two to three sentence answer that is represented here. That's also shown in lists and it's also shown in tables. <clears throat> so any one of those three things shown generally oftentimes at the top of the results is called a featured snippet. Now the featured snippet is generated from amongst the first 10 results. So the search engine has been empowered to answer questions in particular with featured snippets and it will go to any of the first 10 results the first 10 organic results and find what it thinks is the most accurate uh, answer for that query feature snippets do not always show up they can change uh in very short order. So if you do a search query now and you do it again in five minutes, it could be different. Um, but feature snippets are pulled from the first 10 organic results and the search engine is trying to answer the question as accurately as possible. So that's what a feature snippet is and it comes in three different forms. Down below that, often associated with feature snippets are these things called people ask, also ask boxes. The people also ask box is itself made of other featured snippets. So you can see here that for how to remove a sticker from a car window, we see that there are other uh, associated questions with that query. So how do you remove adhesive from car paint? How, you, how do you get a sticker off of glass? How do you get stickers off of a car? These are all other ways of saying that same question, or they are related questions. So if you are creating content, it can be helpful to look at the people also ask box and get a sense of maybe other ways that people are saying it, um, or other ideas that are similar. If you open any one of the people also ask box, so if you click on the down area, what you'll find is that these are all featured snippets themselves. So the search engine is showing you one featured snippet, and then it's also displaying other featured snippets that it feels confident it has an answer in. So that's what the people also ask box is. And then down below that in this example are the organic results. So everything above this portion of the, si of the page it could be considered a SERP feature, and here we actually have the organic results which have been ranked by the prevailing algorithm. So what the organic results are doing is they're trying to match the search intent in some way. <clears throat> the primary goal of the search engine is to deliver value to the user based upon the words or the query that they use. So you're going to see a lot of different changes in the search engine result page, as the search engine tries to give you the most value. So let's take a look at, at this example here. So we can assume that what the search engine is implying is that it says, look, when you ask how to remove a sticker from a car window, people probably click on videos a lot. And so therefore, after enough people click on videos, I'm just going to start showing you videos in those search results. So the top organic result is a YouTube result, which is a video on how to remove stickers off of glass. So there's a video. What we can assume from this is we can assume that the search engine is interpreting our query and saying, look, the way that this person wants to receive this information, right, the most valuable result I can give is in the form of a video. That's what this means when we see that in the top of the results. Here's a different example. Okay, moving away from car stickers, we're looking at flower decoration ideas. What's the very first thing that shows up on this page is an image pack. Okay, so there's a bunch of different images. Again, we can assume that the search engine is saying in this way, 
my guess is that people want to see images of this, so therefore I will show images. It's trying to deliver the most value prop possible with as few clicks by the user. Now here's an interesting thing. Let's take a look at this result page and then look at the previous example. When an image pack shows up high in the results, we'll notice that the images on this navigation tab shows up first. So images shows up first, but what if we go back to that one that has the video? Look at the little red square here. On queries where videos show up more regularly, you'll notice that the video tab shows up first. So you can understand something about the search query and the intent and how how people like to learn or understand information based upon the ordering of that navigation on the top of the search results. So if shopping were to come first and you see a lot of shopping results, you can say something uh, pretty informed about what type of search intent or desire the person has when they're making those kinds of queries. So you can use all of these different features to understand something more about your potential user and about a particular search query to see if it matches up with the content that you have or the objectives you have with your optimization efforts. <clears throat> the main point is a good SEO is always paying attention to these minor changes in the search engine result pages and asking why is that happening? Why is it happening? How is it being formed? Where is the information coming from? There's always slight changes in the search engine result pages, so you have to be constantly thinking about what's changing and why it's changing.